He made an impact as a manager, wrestler, and true innovator in professional wrestling. He began managing at the tender age of 17. He was one of the most hated managers in the country when he was headlining Louisiana and Oklahoma. He managed Terry Garvin and Duke Myers to a United States Tag Team Championship and three Mid-American Tag Team Championships. He managed his wrestling brothers, Terry and Ronnie, to a Tennessee Tag Team title, two Mid-American Tag Team Championships, and a Georgia Tag Team crown. As he got a little older, he became a standout professional wrestler in his own right. As a tag team wrestler, he won the WCW six-man crown, the Florida Tag Titles, the Southern Tag Championship, the WC United States Tag Title, and two Global Tag Championships. He teamed with Mr. Electricity, Stephen Regal, to defeat the Road Warriors for the AWA World Tag Team Championship and as a member of the Fabulous Freebirds with Michael Hayes, the WCW World Tag Team Championship. He won seven different singles championships 11 times. He's a former Bahamas heavyweight champion, world-class television champion, Louisiana heavyweight champion, two-time Florida heavyweight champion, Texas State heavyweight champion, two-time Southern heavyweight champion, and four-time world-class American heavyweight champion. In the mid-80s, he was a leading contender for both the AWA World Heavyweight Championship and NWA World Heavyweight Championship. While he didn't invent the wrestler-valet relationship, he took it to the next level. His relationships and feuds with Precious and Sunshine were the forerunner of the valet today. Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin, welcome to the WrestlingClassics.com shoot interview series. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Mark. Well, it's a, certainly a pleasure to have you. A lot of people talk about starting early in the business and being business in their entire life. You literally grew up in the wrestling industry. Yep, I started when I was nine years old at a special camp for uh, Eddie Graham had run down at 106 North Albany and uh, started amateur wrestling from the age of nine and then through school and then turned pro at 17. Now tell the fans exactly how you got involved with the Eddie Graham camp. My family had apartment houses in Tampa and Joe Scarpa and the great Malenko used to live there and uh, Joe Scarpa seen me out playing around one day in the field that we had next door and we became, became friends and he started talking and you know we just kind of you know he, him being a wrestler and everything of course I was attracted to that and he says hey why don't you come down and try out at the Sportatorium uh, tomorrow it was like a Saturday I think we did it down there. And I said, well, yeah, I'll do that. And then it kind of all started from there. I went down there and tried out, and, and that's where it all started. But Joe Scarpa was the, was the one that initiated. Of course, Joe Scarpa later on to become famous in the Northeast as Chief J. Strongbow. Yeah, great guy, just a great wrestler. You know, I think of him, I think of Don Curtis, uh, Hiro Matsuda, and, 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 and the likes of people like that at that time, great wrestlers, great athletes. Yeah, and great. And you mentioned you lived in the same complex with the great Malenko as well. Yeah, well, they lived at our apartment house. We had an apartment house, and, and Malenko lived there, and Joe lived there. Now, we mentioned this camp, and there were really a lot of guys that came through this camp, including, uh, well, why don't you name the names of some of the guys the that one, you worked out with? The ones I can remember, of course, obviously Mike Graham was there. Uh, Dickie Slater ended up coming through there. I think Bob Orton Jr., maybe when he was younger, came through there. Maybe Steve Kern a little bit later? Steve Kern, maybe a little bit later. Yeah, at the time, when, when I was nine and, uh, and went down there, uh, Steve went, wasn't there yet. It was mostly Mike and I, and I think uh, even Slater came later on. So what was it like shooting with uh, Mike Graham in the ring? <laughs> you know, that was always... Uh, that was always a lot of fun. Uh, you know, the, I always said that I had beat Mike one time. He's a very good amateur wrestler and a very good pro wrestler. And uh, he'll deny it to this day. And uh, it, it's so far uh, far back in time that I can't really remember, but I think it was pretty close. But it's kind of a standing joke between him and I. In fact, I talked to him one time after not talking to him for years. And I, he said, well, who is this? I says, I'm the guy that beat you, at the sport, beat you in the sportatorium. Well, you know, of course he. Does the hair raise up on his neck? Yeah, yeah, of course, you know, because you know you didn't you didn't beat Mike in the sportatorium anyway, you know. <laughs> but uh, he he's a great guy, and uh, and we and we had a lot of fun down there. It was it was tough. It was a great school. Now, a lot of kids when they're 17 are worrying about who to take to the junior prom, worrying about if they're going to get a car, worrying about if they're going to get a passing grade in algebra. What was on your mind at 17? 
uh, try not to get killed by the Mexicans in Arizona. <laughs> God bless them. But, you know, that's where I started, November 1st, 1969. For And you were literally 17 years 17 old. 17 years old, yeah. Ernie Mohammed was the promoter. And, of course, I didn't know a thing. You know, I mean, I didn't know how not to get killed either, you know. So that was probably the, the, the most, most thing on my mind at that time. And, you know, going back to the Sportorium, Gordon Soley. I did my first interview with Gordon Soley when I was nine years old. Oh, was Gordon, did, was Gordon come down to the uh, Sportatorium? and do the, um, the amateur thing, too, and, and interviewed us for TV and, and TV spots, you know, because the program was well-known around the Tampa area for the youth, and Gordon Soley was part of it. I didn't mean to jump back on you. No, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. So how do you end up, so you're 17 years old in Tampa, Florida. How do you end up in Arizona managing Terry Garvin, I believe? Yeah, it was Terry and I that was out there. And I guess we'd have to go back to um, when I was 12 years old. I was still wrestling uh, for Eddie Graham there as an amateur. My father was on the police department, was a captain for the Tampa Police Department. And uh, he passed away uh, when I was 12. And, and then a couple years later, uh, my mom through some other friends, ended up meeting uh, Ronnie Garvin. And eventually, uh, when I was about 15, they got married. And then I met Terry Garvin. <clears throat> and then we'd go uh, to, to Canada in the summertime and go fishing. And, and Larry Kazaboski had a territory up in North Bay. And uh, the, the Funks would go up there and wrestle for Larry and uh, Frankie Kane. And they'd get a lot, of, a lot of good talent up there in the summertime because the fishing was so good. So we as a family, uh, with Ronnie being my stepfather, would go up there in the summertime. Of course, Terry was there too, and Terry and I w was part of the family too. And he knew I had an interest in, uh, in wrestling. And he's the one that said, well, hey, come on, we'll, I'll, help you. We'll, I'll help you break in. So Terry was uh, instrumental in, in doing the Phoenix thing. Had you graduated high school? No, I didn't finish that till later on in my life. So you're 17 years old. I'm going to be generous here. A buck forty. What? I'm going to be generous here. Were you were, were you a buck forty at seventeen? Oh, you know what? I must have weighed. A, yeah, you know, I was about 150 pounds, 160 pounds. So and 170 on a good day. So you're in Arizona. Big. <laughs> so you're in Arizona managing your wrestling brother Terry, mm -hmm. and. You talked to the promoter into giving you a shot. You remember your first interviews? You remember your first promos, first matches? They were horrible. I, I remember them only because I, I can't remember exactly, you know, what I said or who I said about. But I, I remember they were like anybody else that did their first interview. I mean, I had no idea how to do an interview. Uh, luckily, it was a training ground, and the territory wasn't dependent on me, thank goodness, or the other wrestlers to do a good interview or to draw money because I really didn't know. And it was a, it was an on the job kind of experience, learning experience. So I, d you know, I was horrible. You know, I mean, I just, I don't, I don't remember except I'm sure I was bad. Now, by the time you got to Louisiana and Oklahoma, uh, you were flying. You had figured it out. Yeah. Well, you know what happened there after Arizona, we went to Mobile and uh, in Mobile at the time was Bobby Shane. Uh, uh, Cowboy Bob Ellis, I think his name Cowboy is. Cowboy Bob Kelly? Cap Bob Kelly. Uh, th that, that name gets me confused sometimes. There was an Ellis, too, Cowboy. Was yeah, there, there was a Cowboy Bob Ellis. Yeah. He was a big star in the Midwest. He's, yeah, maybe he drifted down in there. But Bob Kelly, the Fields. Right. And uh, the main character I remember back then was Bobby Shane. And that's the first time I met him. <clears throat> and the reason I remember that is because he was such a talent and uh, so much ahead of his time. But we did go to Mobile. We did a run there, and then we went into uh, Oklahoma with Bill Watts in, like, 1971. Right. Uh, and Sam Manneker was doing a promotion with Watts, and Sam Manneker had an airplane, uh, a, a Cherokee 180 or something like that. It was a small single engine, four-seater, and we had to get to a town, so he flew me to this town, and I just immediately fell in love with aviation at that time. Now, I didn't, didn't really put it all together until a little later on, but that was the moment that I fell in love with aviation. Really? Yeah. Because I had never really flown on private airplanes, maybe once. 
uh, prior to that. So really, that would really probably be my second time. The first time I was too young to know anything. So the second time was with Sam, and, and I just fell so much in love with aviation that I started taking lessons on the road. I would take the books and read them in the dressing room or read them in the car on the way to the towns and read them at night and read them on my days off. So that's when that aviation interest started to build when I was about 19 years old. So you're 19 years old, wrestling in Louisiana and Oklahoma, and avoiding getting shot in Wichita Falls. Yeah, avoided getting shot there. The guy was waiting out in the barn. Uh, and to give the fans a little bit of a backstory, they used to have a building in Wichita Falls that was literally run by the 4-H organization. They used to call it the 4-H Arena, which generously called a four, an arena. It was really just a barn, and they had stalls out back. Mm -hmm. They had stalls and some hay barns, right. uh, and this individual was up in the hay barn. He had a uh, rifle and was uh, set up. Uh, he knew what I was wearing and was going to shoot me when I came out the back door. The reason that he didn't shoot me is because somebody had found out about him being positioned up there and the intent of killing me, uh, let the police know and let us know so it was avoided and they, they was able to get him before, uh, before I walked out there and got shot, yeah. Is it true that Billy Red Lions changed sweaters? Yes. Yeah, he was wearing kind of the same color sweater I was. And he looked at me and he looked down at himself and he went, this is coming off, you know. <laughs> I don't want him to make a mistake, you know. Well, not only did you have to avoid gunshots, but what's it like, by this time you probably filled out to maybe 160. Mm -hmm. And as a manager, you were very hated. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes the payoff for the fans would be that if Danny Hodge beat uh, Terry, he got right. five minutes with... With me, yeah, that was in Jackson, Mississippi. And I think it even went into part of that movie, The Wrestling Queen, the Wrestling Queen with uh, Vashon. Yeah. And um, th that was worse than getting shot. That was worse than <laughs> almost getting shot was uh, five minutes with Danny Hodge. Uh, when I think back on this, even to this day, uh, Danny Hodge, when the bell rang, and he had five minutes with me, when, that, when that, the crowd, of course, went crazy. And I remember Jackson, Mississippi, uh, the arena and everything. Danny, Danny Hodge's eyes kind of rolled up in the back of his head like a great white does, like right before it <laughs> eats a seal or something, you know? And uh, when he got a hold of me, it, I, really, I really saw my life pass in front of me. Well, Danny, of course, was a two-time Olympian, got cheated. The worst cheat job in the history of the Olympics in 1960 uh, was a, a lot of people consider Danny Hodge to be the greatest amateur of all time. He has double tendon strength. So when he got his hands on you, you weren't going anywhere. You just the, the man was uh, like you said with a double tendon strength. Uh, when he would grab something, what we would normally grab, when he would grab it, it would be just like double the strength. I mean, he would take shower knobs and turn them to where they were off, and he could keep turning them until they broke off. He'd take car doors and turn and open them. He could actually turn them until they broke off. Uh, he could break pliers. So, I mean, when he got a hold of you, that's, it, he, it was phenomenal. It was superhuman strength. And the fact that he was a very, very good amateur wrestler, well, to say the least. Yeah. That's an understatement, actually. Yeah, three years undefeated. If, if freshmen had been eligible, Cale Sanderson from, uh, would have tied Danny Hodges' record because he never lost. In Matter of fact, not only he was never taken down as a collegian. No, in Oklahoma, of all places. Right. I mean, you're not talking about run-of-the-mill wrestlers out in Oklahoma. I mean, they're, they're world famous for some of the greatest wrestlers in the world from Oklahoma. But the reason you're getting the opportunity to see your life, life flash in front of your eyes by Danny Hodge was the fact that you and Terry were doing very well. Your interviews had gotten good enough that you were drawing. When did the light go off, at least as a manager, that your interviews were getting to be very good and that you would be good at this? I think... In, I think um, because, number one, I was terrible in, in Arizona, I went to Mobile and watched Bobby Shane very closely and watched his interviewing and, and the other talent that was there. So that gave me some, some, some background and some foundation. And then going into Oklahoma, we had so many interviews to do because the territory was so vast. So then I got the actual experience to take what I had learned and saw in Mobile 
and put it in put it in my own style, which I didn't really have a style yet, but it was starting to develop. But with the Bobby Shane experience, I'll call it that, and with my own style starting to come, and with the constant practice of doing so many interviews for Watts or McGurk at the time, right. um, I started getting a handle on it. I started to see, okay, this is this is how you should say things, and this is when you should say them and when you shouldn't. So timing, my timing started to start to get a little polished. Uh, I always did. I never really, I always did off the cuff type stuff too. I never really thought about what I was gonna say. I always would do it like we're talking now. I mean, I, I don't have any idea what's gonna come out of my mouth next. I'm just talking to you, you know, what's co going through my mind at the time. And my interviews were, were that way too. And, they, and then, then I just developed, uh, it started to develop. It wasn't de totally developed yet, but I could see it was starting to develop to where I was feeling a little more comfortable and I had a little more experience. So therefore the comfort level increased so that that would be the Oklahoma days I knew that okay I can do this I'm gonna be better but I, I can at least I can hold my own right now of course your aspirations were to be a wrestler more than a manager Absolutely. when did you put on enough weight where you could go ahead and put on the trunks well <clears throat> two years in Oklahoma that didn't happen there um, after that, I did wrestle a bear in uh, Wichita Falls. Well, that was with the Oklahoma, which is another story. But uh, I'm trying to re recap it in Nashville after that. So I guess, the, you know, the really the first real time, it would have probably uh, been in Charlotte later on. Okay. Because like, I managed in 74 in Atlanta. And then, you know, uh, 75, uh, I think we went to Australia for a while. 76, I took off, and we, of course, we'll get all of that. So I think it was probably, you know, we're talking 77, maybe. Of course, I, I had been in the ring as a manager a lot right. from 69 all the way through, but, to, to, but I was hired as a manager up until probably 77 with Crockett the first time. Okay. And you and you probably know more about me than I do. So if I'm wrong, you can correct me. But I'm just thinking that, you know, I've, I've, all those those years that I mentioned, I was always a manager. Okay. Even though I would occasionally get sure. to wrestle, but I was I, they didn't hire. I was hired as a manager. I don't think I was hired as a wrestler until uh, '77, and then I was probably 200 pounds maybe. So you're in Florida. Your matches are good. Of course, you had the great amateur background dating back from when you were nine years old. What did Lester Welch tell you that really changed your career? Opelika, Florida. Uh, we were traveling. I know Ernie Ladd was with, with me because we were in the back of a van going home that night. But um, Lester Welch, I came in from the, from the match, and Lester said, Jim, can I talk to you for a minute? And Lester had known me since I was a kid. And he says, you know, he says, you got a good background. You're a good wrestler. He says, but you don't have any color. You know, you have, you know, you have the same tights. It's kind of a drab type sports Adidas, Nike, for the sake of not mentioning names of companies. But yeah, had the porn mustache. <clears throat> had the porn mustache, yeah. And, um, and there wasn't, yeah, he, he was in essence telling me that I just had no, nothing that anybody would really want to pay to see. Right. I mean, yes, I was a good wrestler, uh, but that don't sell tickets. At least, you know, not in my case, you know. Uh, he says, you need a gimmick. Uh, you need some color. You need something that people want to see. And, that, and then, of course, that just was like, oh, my God, he's exactly right. You know, I had to take a look, and I said, he's right. And then all the way home, I'm thinking, thinking, thinking. And then, do you want me to go on with what happened sure, there? Yeah. So <clears throat> over the next few weeks, I was thinking, okay, what's it gonna be? what am I going to do? Because I wasn't a real gimmick person anyway, right. believe it or not. I mean, I went from not being a gimmick person to being relatively pretty, pretty gimmick person, you know, to a, to a degree. And I said, okay, um, Gorgeous George came to my mind. Uh, Bobby Shane came to my mind. 
Uh, Gorgeous George, of course, first because he had the valet that used to use the big bug sprayer. Atomizer, yeah. Yeah, and then he would come to the ring and throw bobby pins, and they played like a pomp and circumstance type song. Right. And this is back in the 50s, I, I think, you know. Oh, so far ahead of his time is frightening. Yeah, it was just like, incredible. But he was a great wrestler, a great uh, tactician, but man, what a gimmick. I mean, he had the robes and the bobby pins and the curlers, and I guess when you think back in the 50s, if a guy had curlers, curly hair with bobby pins, that's enough heat right there to get your butt whipped, right? Well, he was the first guy to bleach his hair. How much peroxide has Gorgeous George sold over the last 50 years? He's the reason, you know, people bleach their hair <laughs> still yeah. to this day. I don't know. But I said, okay, I'm, I'm on it. I started feeling like I was on the right track. I was thinking of Bobby Shane. I said, okay, Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin. That's the gimmick. Okay, Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin. I had relatively long hair, not really at the time, but kind of. I said, that's not a big deal. So I took... I said, I got to get some robes. So I didn't have a lot of money because, uh, you know, God bless him, but Eddie Graham wasn't exactly, you know, uh, the greatest payoff guy in the world, you know. So I didn't have a lot. Plus, I wasn't on top, you know. I was just like second, first, second, third match. First, second, third, middle of the road sometimes. So I took, uh, I said, how can I do this because I don't have much money? So I I thought, okay, I'll tuxedo jackets, you know, because the old uh, the, the, the tuxedo rental places, when they would rent one and it would get a stain on it, like a white one, they couldn't get it out. They would have basically would be useless to them. So I thought, I can get that tuxedo jacket relatively inexpensive, and then I'll get um, my mother-in-law, which eventually did a lot of my stuff, but at the time, it was one of the wrestler's wives, and, and uh, I don't know if it was Pedro Godoy. I don't think it was that. It may have been, but one of the... One of the wrestler's wives, that maybe his name had come to me, uh, Raul Mata, maybe it was him, his wife. I got her to sew sequins, <clears throat> and it was a gold sequin jacket that I still have, to sew sequins on this tuxedo jacket. So it, it kept my expense down. So I said, okay, that's the glitter part. Then I said, okay, I need a valet. Well, you know, I you know, had some contacts in Tampa, and, and Eddie Graham uh, had, had knew, knew somebody, and... Anyway, I got this valet. And I said, the original Precious. Which is the original Precious. And I said, okay. And then I can't use the bug sprayer, so I'll use aerosol can. So, okay, I got the flashy coat. I got the, you know, the, the idea in my head about this gorgeous Jimmy Garvin character. I got the valet because there was really none in, in the world. Uh, I think uh, there was one floating around down south in Mobile, but they weren't national. And I can't remember right. his name. She said they were from England. There was, there, was, there was Adrian Street, Miss Linda. That's who I'm there thinking about. There was Jack Dalton's wife used to manage him and Buddy Colt back in the 60s or early right. 70s. Nothing that ever right. bloomed. Nothing, Nothing that happened. Bloomed. It was right. just like the, the, the seed never really came up out of the ground on that. So I didn't, so that wasn't the issue. So then I said, okay. I took the publicity pictures. I went to the office and I threw my stuff down on the table and I said, here's the deal. You know, uh, this is what I want to do. And I said, okay, uh, Dusty at the time was the booker. He said, uh, Lakeland, Florida, that's where you start it. I said, okay. So I went up to Lakeland ahead of time, and I got with the building. They knew me because I'd been uh, going up there since, uh, you know, for years. And I said, when, when it comes time for my match, I want you to dim the lights, uh, his spotlight, you know, give him a few dollars. They're all union guys. Give me a spotlight, and then I want you to play this uh, Don Henley, Dirty Laundry, Nobody was really using music at the time. Right. If any, I don't, I don't think, you know, Michael Hayes and uh, the Freebirds did later, but I don't even think, or if they did, they were doing it almost at the same time that I started, they started. It was well, maybe a I, I hate to break it to you, but it's probably Leroy Brown. Leroy Brown, did he do it too? Yeah, he was doing Bad, Bad Leroy Brown. Okay, that's okay. You know, it's, I'm glad, see, like I said, you know more <laughs> about my stuff than I do, but uh, there wasn't a lot of it. But I'm not getting in the middle between you and Michael. You no. guys can keep having that debate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I thought, okay, that's the song, and then I got the lighting. So anyway, it came time, the bell rang, the lights went down, the spotlight went on, out comes a beautiful girl, uh, Don Henley singing Dirty Laundry. Uh, I all of a sudden started strutting. I don't know where that came from, it just the moment, which stuck for the entire the rest Fargo, of The Fargo strut, which you <clears> It was better up. than Fargo strut. It was I better tell. than the Fargo strut. Fargo did kind of a thing like, it was a real deliberate kind of, the, the Steve Kern and them, used to do it. Right. Uh, the, mine was much better. But anyway, <laughs> that's another story. <clears throat> so, so anyway, I started doing the real strut, and um, 
and that's when that, and that's when uh, that's when my career took off. Uh, you know, that was it. Now the, the career takes off. You're one of the guys that's in the territory at the time, David Von Erich. Jack mm-hmm. Briscoe had br- uh, talked David Von Erich into coming down to Florida and learn mm-hmm. how to work as a heel. Mm-hmm. And you and David became friends. Very good friends when David was down there. Uh, God bless David. You know, I think of him to this day often. And uh, David and I ran together and became very good friends. And uh, he's the one that said, hey, when you, you know, when you get finished here, I'll come to Texas. I want you to come to Texas and we'll... We'll, we'll, we'll do something there. And I said, okay, that'd be fine. Now, in the meantime, you had to make some lineup changes. Yeah, yeah, I did. With the valet? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I did. Because um, the limo used, well, Mike Graham let me borrow a limo that he had, and it was like a 1928 or something. It was like a really old limo, but it was a limo, and it was it's black. It's a limo, man. It was limo, it was black, and it was long. <laughs> and it was cheap, so that was okay. So we'd, we would uh, go, the limo would come to my house, and this girl would come up and get out and come to my front door, and, you yeah. know, my wife would be there, and then she'd say, is Jimmy ready, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm taking, I'm taking I'm your t- husband out in this limo for the night. <laughs> oh, yeah, and sometimes for two, three, sometimes if we go fly, <laughs> we'd go two or three days or something, you know, and, whew, you know, I could feel that this wasn't, this wasn't getting over at home. Uh, and, and, and it shouldn't have And understandable. Oh, yeah, understandable. I mean, if Patty started running around with Pierce Brosnan, you yeah, would have him, something to say. Yeah, yeah, I'd be like a little pissed off myself. But um, it just wasn't, it was causing stress. And so I had to make some changes because it just wasn't, it wasn't going to be good. So I got rid of that valet, but I had to have another valet because the, the the gimmick, I knew the gimmick was the gimmick needed a valet. Yeah, the gimmick needed a valet, and I could see the potential as it was snowballing. So I told my wife, I said, "Okay, my cousin Valerie." I said, "What if I can get her to do it?" It's my cousin, you know. That way, it's better, you know. When I and you're not from West Virginia or Kentucky. Not from West Virginia or Kentucky, you know. Which, you know Just uh, kidding, people <coughs> from West Virginia and Kentucky. Oh, yeah, they, you got a lot of heat now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said it, not me. Um, but you were thinking it. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I was. But I says, okay, I'll get my cousin Valerie because that way, you know, we'll go on the road and it'll be all right. Well, my poor cousin Valerie, and, and God bless her too, what a talent she was because. She was brilliant. Brilliant. It runs in the family thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that, that's another story. <laughs> um, I told her, I says, hey, here's the deal. I, I remember, I says, I, yeah, I got a job for you. I said, I want you to be my valet. I'm a what? She said, I mean, I don't think she, thinks she knew what a valet yeah, she was. Doesn't, she didn't watch wrestling. So she didn't have a clue. She didn't have a clue. I said, here's what you do. So I said, she didn't even know. And I said, come on, we're going to Texas. And Because um, David had kept his word. You David, finished your run in Florida yep, and you called David. And- yeah, I mean, everything was, the, the red carpet was rolled out. I mean, Texas was waiting for us. So I, Valerie and I went to Texas. And uh, we did a few shows in Tampa with her, I guess, to just knock the edges off. And then we went to Texas, and the, the poor girl dropped into a hotbed because immediately, we just immediately... A couple of things happened. First of all, David Von Erich puts you over as strong as any Von Erich put over a heel, start, start off the bat. Second... You arrived just a few months after the Freebirds and the Von Erichs started their feud. Right. Chris Adams and Iceman King Parsons, nobody nationally knew who they were, no, but, but they Chris, were... Chris may have just, just came in. From Los Angeles. Yeah, maybe even a little bit, maybe a week or two after me or something. Yeah. Nobody knew who they were, but they were ready. Yeah, they were ready. And, I mean, you had underneath guys, I mean, you had Johnny Mantell in the second match. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the same time, you've got uh, the Pat Robertson station, Channel 39 in Dallas, who had purchased literally millions of dollars worth of television equipment and was looking for something to produce, was looking, comes to the da- uh, Dallas office and goes, please let us do this four-camera, state-of-the-art television production of your wrestling show. And at the same time, all the talent gelled, including you. Yeah, it was a magic moment in, uh, in wrestling. 
That's the only thing that comes to my mind. I mean, all the stars were lined up and everything was perfect, all as the stuff that you said. The talent was there, the television was there, the production was there. And the bottom line is the talent. The talent was just, n not only was the talent there, but the talent w that was there was all ready to bloom at the same time, which is so rare. Right. It's so rare. You might have a territory and you might have two bloomers, let's call them, that are blooming to be superstars. Right. Uh, you know, I think of uh, here in the Carolinas, you know, a steamboat. There was a time. I mean, he was just that was he was he was blooming. Yeah, Blur and Steamboat almost together. Yeah, at the same. There's two. Well, we had the whole the whole friggin' card was blooming from the second match, maybe even the first match on. Certainly, half the card was just totally getting ready to catch completely on fire. And this beautiful looking state of the art television that was syndicated all over the all over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was an incredible moment because. The electricity in the air. When I think about the Channel 39 and doing the Dallas stuff, and you had you had the Von Erich boys, all three of them, man, they were on fire in their in their hearts. You had the Freebirds that were on fire in their hearts. You had uh, I'm not to rehash, but Chris Adams, uh, myself, King Parsons, King Parsons, and that's just to mention just the, that handful right there. There was more, but those that I just mentioned. We were all getting ready to ignite, and we could, and all of us by ourselves had enough charisma and talent to carry a whole territory, so to speak. You know, one man can't carry it all, but right. I mean, I'm being I'm exaggerating a little bit. But you bit, could have but built a territory around <coughs> any of the people we just mentioned. Yeah, we could have built six or seven territories with the talent that was on one card. Right. I, you know, okay, we'd build four territories. With the with talent that was on that card. No, I think you were right the first There's time. Honest seconds. to goodness, I, I. But it was nothing. Was it? We didn't plan it that way. Uh, we didn't try to. The, but the, it like just you happened. Said, the stars aligned. Yeah, it just happened. We didn't have to sit down and go. Now, how are we going to do this? We. Now, didn't, it just happened. Now something else happened too, because. No, well, you did. Yeah, probably a lot of stuff happened. But <laughs> well, go ahead, <laughs> Jimmy. I'd, let, let's talk about that a little bit because here's the thing: you're basically everybody in the territory that we've talked about are in their mid twenties. Mm -hmm. Wrestling has gone from doing very well to becoming a phenomenon. Right. Uh, you're not just wrestlers, you're rock stars. Yeah. And you're all in your mid-20s, yeah. and everywhere you go, the f party follows. Yep, yep. <laughs> Feel free to expound. <laughs> well, I'm trying to filter what I'm gonna say, but it was incredible. Uh, I'm trying to, I, I think back on it and um, I think back on it and I got to tell you this and the, and the thing that comes to my mind which is so incredible that would match this is when Valerie and I went to Texas we went first by ourselves, and when we got there uh, the Freebirds had an apartment at this location and then we had a, we, Val and I got an apartment across the street which was going to be because Patty and uh, and Lacey, uh, I take that back, Patty and Brienne, my oldest now, were coming to join us later. Lacey was actually born in Irving. Uh, so we have this apartment. Well, we were, there, we were there two or three months ahead of time before my family finally came. And um, we never stayed at the apartment. We always stayed across the street at the Freebirds apartment, which was Buddy, Terry, and Michael. And Michael. So that place the front door didn't even it wasn't even on hinges because when we would come home maybe we'd come home a different time or something and we would have a key so we would just kick the door down so that happened so many times that we we didn't even bother we just propped the door up on the face everybody knew who lived there and we didn't have to worry about nobody coming in uh, it, no no problem because nobody would ever want to go there anyway unless they were with one of us <clears throat> for their own safety but um, we, I had an apartment across the street that I never went to. We, we partied at that uh, apartment and lived at that apartment, all of us at the same time. Uh, and everywhere we went was a party. I mean, I don't, I, there were so many. I mean, every night was a party. Every morning was a party. Everybody. We would wake up in the morning. I, I can't tell you 
how many mornings uh, we'd wake up, and uh, Jack Daniels was our friend back then. And we would just, we'd have a big old thing of Jack right off the bat. And, this is in the morning. And you're making, inc by wrestling standards, big money. Yeah, yeah, we, money wasn't an issue. You know, money wasn't an issue. There was nothing was an issue. There was no law. We had no law in Texas. We could do whatever we wanted to do. How much of that was that the Von Erich boys liked to party, but Fritz re refused to believe they liked to party, so therefore... Well, they had to party undercover. See, because everybody, you know, they were, they were scrutinized more because, because they were the Von Erichs and because of their father and because of Texas, and they, and they were baby faces. So, I mean, they couldn't exactly act too outrageous. They had, a, a, they had to, to be the way they were supposed to be. On the other hand, we didn't have any, we didn't have to be nothing that we didn't want to be. We had no rules. You know, the, the wilder we were, it didn't matter. We were like kids in a, in, a, in a candy store. Buddy Roberts, one of the legendary, how do I put this politely? It doesn't, it's okay. You don't have to be polite. One of the legendary drinkers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how scary is it when your cousin Valerie becomes his drinking buddy? Yeah, for days. Two days straight in uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas, they stayed up drinking Jack Daniels. And the toilet bowl was so full of cigarette butts it wouldn't flush. It looked like the Okie Finoki swamp. It was a, it was a, uh, uh, we came in the room to check on them after the second day. They're sitting in the middle of this huge suite on the floor. They had a c couple of half gallons of Jack Daniels gone, cigarettes everywhere, and they were just talking. I mean, there was never nothing going on between them. They just would have a few drinks Drink a few gallons. But, Buddy would rather drink than get laid, wouldn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he would. He, it was incredible. I, I can't. Uh, there's so many stories about the drinking that went on there. It was absurd. But it did start to affect business. No. How? I, Valerie at some point. Oh, because of Val. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but, but you know, I remember times where um, that was one thing that, you know, we would go out and party. <clears throat> but when the show, when it come time to do a show, we were on. I mean, we oh yeah, the matches were great. Yeah, nobody ever knew that we hadn't slept for two days, or, or that we were pretty much. I mean, this shit faced, this, you know, to say, to yeah. you know, we would go out and wrestle the boys, the Von Erics, we or, or I'd go wrestle Chris, and they they would be okay. Uh, we'd be flat tore up. Uh, we'd be flat tore up. But we'd go out there and wrestle them for thirty minutes, forty five minutes, whatever it took. And it's so the work. And we're talking about hard hitting hard, Texas style wrestling. Yeah, we, yeah, we kicked each other's butts, and we liked it because that's the way it was supposed to be, and that was what Texas wrestling was all about. And we did it. And then getting back to like with Val and that, yeah, <clears throat> Val started. Val could party with the best of them. She could. She could. God bless her. She was thrown in that environment though. I mean, it's like, you know. Yeah, it is like getting a PhD in drinking. Yeah. Yeah, she graduated ahead of her class. She's, we all did. We got our masters. <laughs> but, 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 at what, but there came a point where it really, two things happened. First of all, Valerie started to become so popular, you almost needed to try to turn her baby face. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, as Something much as had you'd to like to party, you also, business came first with you. Right, right. So... <clears throat> and what you're what you're referencing is, it's true. We had did the the Texas Stadium thing. We had run this thing out, and I was starting to see in my mind, because uh, being in control of my gimmick, is that. Well, and let's back up there. I mean, you were when David brings you in. It's with the understanding that you booked your own angles and pretty and, much and, and pretty much called your own finishes. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you can. How? Yeah. Did you just, would you just go to Ken Mantell and say, hey, Ken, here's what I'm thinking? Mike and I were good friends. And Mike and I would sit at night and have drinks and we'd talk. And so the Freebirds were basically booking their own stuff, too. Yeah, yeah. Mike was, Mike, of course, Mike was assistant booker with Kenny, if not like part of the booker, two bookers, Kenny right. and Mike. So it was, I, I had the front door. Not only did I have to, I could go in the office and say, this is what I'm thinking. I would just, I would never even have to go in the office. I could t keep, keep drinking and just tell Mike, this is what I'm thinking. And then Mike would go and tell Kenny. So I never had to leave the party and my ideas would still get through. But yeah, I always did my, Mike was 
Mike was instrumental too, though. He was, uh, Mike and I worked well because we would not only work with my gimmick, but I would work with his and the, and the Freebird and the Von Erich gimmick. And we'd, all, and we'd also, Mike and I would work with the other characters that were on the, in the territory. So Kenny Mantell was smart enough to sublimate his ego mm -hmm. and just, okay, okay, Michael, that's fine, okay. Jimmy Kenny was a great sounding board too, and, and he was a great, he had a great mind as well. Right, but I mean. But he didn't have the off the wall stuff like that Mike and I would come up with. But he, but it speaks to Kenny's character mm -hmm. that he wasn't a control freak. No. His ego wasn't no. so big that he, he would let you guys have your freedom. Yeah, because I mean, we sold out reunion six, Times in a row. The seven, first time you sold know. it, everybody was amazed. Nobody ever thought you could sell out seventeen thousand seats in Texas. Yeah, and we did it six or seven times in a row. Uh, then, of course, you know, by then you turned uh, Sunshine Babyface. You brought in Precious. It's it's well, it, well it's, it may be the hottest feud in the country, not just Texas. I think it was the hottest feud in the world. I'll go out on a limb and think that when the when the Chris Adams and Sunshine against Patty and I or the split happened. And then she got, came on TV and said that she had all my tapes and she was going to give them to Chris and that she did that interview that was, she, was classic where she told the people that, you know, and she told me on TV that she loved me and cared about me and all that stuff and tears in her eyes. And I mean, that was some heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. Getting back to what you were saying, I could see that Texas now, we had been there almost a year and we'd, we'd, it was time to go. I had to leave for my own health, probably, but it was time to go. I, I in my the, mind, the, the, knew. Well, the blow-off was Texas Stadium. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, it was top five all time, both in attendance and box office. 38,000 people pay $450,000. Uh, Kerry Von Erich wins the world title from Ric Flair. Of course, that's the follow-up after David Von Erich passes away. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Fritz comes out of retirement to team mm -hmm. with his sons against the Freebirds, mm -hmm. and also on top was you and the Precious against Chris Adams and Sunshine. Yeah, huge. I don't know a, 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 an event that had that magnitude and all those things uh, that were involved. But the point is, though, as we were getting at, is that I knew we were having to go somewhere. I was going to go somewhere. How much did the payoff? From Texas Stadium, motivate you that it was time to go. Not not that much. But but you were disappointed. With oh, the absolutely, absolutely. The payoff sucked. Um, the payoff. Four hundred fifty thousand dollar house, and you and and your match was either second from the top or third from the top. Right. It was one of the main events. Yeah. It was. It was. It was. I couldn't have the top match because that belonged to Larry and Carey. The other one of the Von Erichs. Right. I couldn't have the match under that match because that belonged to the other Von Erichs. Right. So I took. So third, after the Von Erichs got done, then I was I was right in there. <laughs> so third from the top for a four hundred fifty thousand dollar house. What yeah. was the payoff? What was the payoff? Yeah. Thirty five hundred bucks. On a four hundred fifty thousand dollar house. Yeah, thirty five hundred bucks. It and was that probably good thing I was good thing I didn't care about money because I'd have really been pissed <laughs> off now. <laughs> well, a lot of guys left the territory after the Texas Stadium show because yeah. they were upset about the payoff. Yeah, the payoff was horrible, but it didn't influence me. I was going anyway. Okay, but you so you were so I was going. Motivate. They could have paid me twenty grand. I was going. Okay. They could have paid me a hundred grand. Well, I might have stayed for that, but I was <laughs> I was le I was leaving. I had already know that I, I knew that it was time was running out because. Uh, they had switched Sunshine Babyface, so that so she could never come back to me. Right. So that so now I had to continue on, so I needed another valet. Because I was go I was I had to gorgeous Jimmy Garvin, wasn't going to die in Texas. Well, and by this point, you and Patty were so hot, Precious were so hot, you were getting offers from all over the country. Right. Um, That's another story too. Getting Patty to do this. That was a hard deal. Yeah, that was so, a hard sell, wasn't it? Yeah, that was real hard. Because, again, like Valerie, she didn't have no, know nothing about that. You know I mean? She stayed away from the business. She wasn't involved in it. Uh, first 200 times I asked her when it was coming down the pike, she told me, you know, in a polite way to, you know, no, you know, kiss my butt. You know, I'm not doing that. That's his home release. She can say what she said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she, used to, she, was, she just was adamant about she wasn't doing that. Right. So she, when she came in in Fort Worth that first time, and I came out and I gave her the, as a present to Sunshine, right. that was her first exposure on television, her first TV show. 
And, and you could tell by looking at it now, she was a nervous wreck and she really didn't know what she was doing. And then what followed, the weeks to follow, when her and Sunshine would fight, that was such incredible stuff because neither one of them knew how to work. So they were shooting. And it was. Oh, well, it looked like a shoot. It was a shoot. It, we were like scared ourselves to watch them shoot because yeah. somebody was really going to get hurt bad. And we, we tried to always tell them, look, just try not to break nobody's nose or teeth or jaw or something like that because, uh, gosh, dogs, they would fight. They would fight cats and dogs. Well, women can get competitive. Yeah, they're tough. They scared me. Yeah. When you think of sunshine. As your valet, the thing that always struck me is the intensity. She's on the apron. David Von Erich's got you in an extended wrist lock. She looks like she's about to cry on the floor. Mm -hmm. Later on, Precious comes in. Patty comes in as your valet. Same thing. Very intense. Uh, their battles almost look like shoots. You, you yeah. mentioned that. Yeah. How much of a fresh perspective did it bring the fact that they didn't have any wrestling experience? That they just they, they just kind of did what they thought it should look like. I think that was the, I think that was the key. I think if they would have had experience, it would have gotten away, so to speak. Uh, the fact that they neither one of them had any previous experience or any experience at all, that they were doing their parts from their heart, not from past experiences or not from something they'd done or seen or something like that. It was all like from the heart. This is how they, they were reacting. And yeah, but, so it was very natural. But did they always listen to you? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. They, kn they knew I wouldn't tell them nothing okay. bad. They knew that uh, that I knew what I was doing and, and this was the plan and I'd talk to them both and, and you know, this is, the, this is, this is what we're going to try to do. Uh, how, this is the, the, the I'm trying to, to uh, give you an idea like I would more or less, I would start from backwards. I'd say, this is what we want to end up with. Right. When all this is said and done, this is what we want to end up with. Now, this is where we're at now. So let's do whatever we need to do in between to get over here or to get over here to end up where, you know, this is where we need to be. And we would talk about it and, and they would just do it. I mean, it, a lot of times they just amazed me. They would do and say stuff that we never even talked about because it just was such a, it came from their heart. When it was time for your run to be over in Texas, you were getting offers from literally all over the country. Mm -hmm. You got an offer to come to the Carolinas from mm -hmm. Jim Crockett, mm -hmm. an offer to come to the AWA from Bern Gagne. Mm -hmm. there, I, I don't know this, but why do I have a feeling there were some other offers there too? There, there, was, some, there was some offers. There was an, uh, Vince McMahon was in the mix too. Um, I don't remember exactly who I was talking with or how we got the, the words came about or how, you know, who I was dealing with. But why, why was it that you ended up going to Minnesota and the AWA instead of the Carolinas or, well, we'll talk about Vince McMahon later and yeah. the WWE later, but why did you end up in the, in Minnesota instead of the Carolinas? Carolinas, yeah. I just always wanted to work for Vern Gagne. Uh, he was a legend. Uh, his territory was legendary. The AWA uh, had uh, had sprouted a lot of stars. It was the, 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 that came from there, or at least had a good their first push there. I was just impressed with his organization. And um, as we, as we were talking earlier, you know the ESPN thing was there. Yeah, he was on ESPN at the time. Yeah, very strong. Uh, he was traveling all over. Uh, and I just, I guess I just really wanted to go see what he was all about. I already knew what Crockett was all about because I knew Flair was here and I knew, I knew who was in here. Right. Uh, I didn't know who was in AWA. Now at the time, the AWA World Heavyweight Champions, Rick Martell. Right. Now, did Vern, when Vern came to you, what type of an offer did he make? Come to work on top with Rick Martell or come and let's see how it works out, or exactly how did he approach you? Really, it was just um, an open offer to come and work in his territory because he knew, because of my background and my track record in Texas and in Florida, uh, that, w that I was going to do well for him. He knew that I would that, that, that I'd be on top for him, and he knew that when I got there, everything would fall in place because, I, I mean, he I just feel that he knew I knew how to work operate my, my gimmick and I knew knew what I needed to do. 
Of course, the gimmick explodes in Texas a large part, and I know you'll give credit to Chris Adams mm -hmm. for how great those matches were and mm -hmm. what a great talent Chris is. Absolutely. And we all miss him, too. He's a great guy, great worker, uh, great guy to have a beer with. Or two. Uh, or two. Or 12. Or 12. He was just a good guy, and uh, it was unfortunate that he ended up uh, how he did, but it ha but happens to the best of them, not only in wrestling, but in They're Hollywood. Or, the grace of God. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just a, just a bad break, I mean, terrible thing that, that, that happened to him uh, with, with him getting shot by his best friend. Right. For those who didn't know, I mean, uh, and we don't have to get into that a whole right. lot, you know, it was just a bad situation. Uh, he was going through some tough times, you know. He, you know, he just had, he had a hard time to go. But when I was with him, it was it was good. It was in the good times. So, you, but you get up to the AWA, and let me ask you this: Somebody had to go to Chris Adams and tell Chris, Chris, we've got this idea. We're going to give you your own valet. It's going to be Sunshine. She's going to be a baby face. And we're going to do this, this, and this, and this. Were you the one that approached? Was it your idea for Chris to be the opponent? I think it was uh, the obvious. I think it was obvious to all that was involved, and that, that means Kenny Mantel, myself, and uh, Michael. Michael Hayes, right. that uh, Chris Adams was the guy I would run. That I would run this angle with. Yeah, because he. Because really, the other guys were busy. You really couldn't do it with the Von Erichs, because they were tied up with Flair and the Freebirds. Right. Uh, and mostly the birds. And in, in, in Texas in the 80s, you couldn't do it with King Parsons. No, no. Chris Chris was just the ne He was the man. You know, he right. was the one that I'd, I'd do the angle with. Now, let me ask you this. Let's say that for whatever reason, Chris had said, no, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. Did you have a backup plan? No, because he would not, n nobody in their right mind would ever say, no, I don't want to do that. Because it was such, you know, he knew where he was at. He, you know, he like you said, he just came in from L.A. or someplace, right. doing relatively nothing, and then to be thrown into the hotbed of the wrestling world in Texas at the time, just to be on any part, of, in, just to be on the card, was was great, even if you were on the first match. Uh, but to be a part of a main event, you, you just wouldn't say no to that. Did you know the match would travel? At the time, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know it would travel at the time because I didn't know what their ideas were. St. Louis is the most conservative territory maybe in the history of man. Mm -hmm. And Larry Matisic and, and Harley Race and Pat O'Connor bring the match to St. Louis. It was so hot. They sold it out, too. And sold it out. Every time we was there. Kansas City, too. So you go up to Minneapolis, and now it's just Jimmy Garvin and Precious. There's mm -hmm. no, there's no sunshine on the other side to do all that stuff. Gorgeous right. Jimmy Garvin. Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin. I don't stand, forget, I stand don't forget the gorgeous part. <laughs> uh, you were very quickly in the AWA World Title picture with Rick Martel. It was just a natural. Um, I think that uh, Vern and Bachwinkle and the guys whoever was doing the book at the time saw that that. Uh, Martel and I could have the have great matches, and, and we did, because he was such a great talent. And that's a wrestling territory. Yes, that is a wrestling territory. And so, I think it speaks well of you and your ability that you could get over in a wrestling territory. Because yes, without question, the gimmick was over. Mm -hmm. But if you couldn't wrestle, then it doesn't work. Yeah, it wasn't going to be uh, as spectacular. But the fact that I could wrestle and the, and the fact that my background would speak for itself and Martel was such talent, you, it was like magic again to a degree. Is Martel, when people talk about the, the top stars of the 80s, you don't hear Rick Martel's name that often. And that's kind of a shame, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That is a shame. And I don't know if it was because he didn't travel as much because you know when and you maybe you would know more than this uh, than I but you know he didn't get around he didn't get he didn't even though we were on ESPN you would right. think someone would say you know let's bring Martel to the Carolinas let's bring Martel let's, to Florida let's, let's bring him to him Florida let's bring him back down to Texas and see if they could revive that or something but um, he um, I don't think he liked to travel that much I think he'd spend his winters in Minneapolis with Vern and he'd go to Quebec City in the summertime. And uh, I guess he didn't care about it. I don't know. But, you know, it's true. He, 
He was a, a, he he was enormously talented, enormously talented. Great wrestler. Great wrestler. I mean, when I think about going in the ring with him, I mean, we wouldn't have to talk about hardly nothing. I mean, as long as we knew the finish, and we knew what we were going to do in the finish, we knew how we were going to go into it. It was always interesting because him and I would go in the ring, and we wouldn't know what we was going to do first. We wouldn't know what we was going to do for the next 20 minutes or 25 minutes. It would just happen with him and I. Martell was in a long list of great world champions that you had a chance to be in the ring with. I'm going to name some names. Let's see. You got to wrestle Pat O'Connor. Mm -hmm. What was it like wrestling O'Connor? It was an experience because I was very young at the time, and uh, and had, you know he was just such a legend and such a wrestler that I was just mesmerized. I mean, I I was just trying to hang on. You wrestled uh, Luthez. Luthez. I wrestled the same thing. You know, I was young. Uh, I knew who I was in the ring with, and I could feel it. Th that has to be scary. When you're in the ring, well, maybe scary is the wrong word, but... Thrilling. Thrilling to be in a yeah. ring with a guy that magnitude. Mm -hmm. and, and be at such a young age. Yeah, and to be in the ring with somebody like that. Butterflies? Yeah, serious. But yet, at the same time... You, you had to keep your head, you know, to try to, you know, at least not embarrass yourself too badly. Who were you more nervous about being in the ring with, Fez or Hodge? Hodge. He was <laughs> a maniac. <laughs> Hodge would hear the crowd. You know, the crowd could really get him going, man. You know, some people didn't care about the, 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 the hollering and the, you know, the cheering. But Hodge took his cheering seriously. And if uh, people were saying, you know... Thank goodness they weren't saying off with his head because he would probably <laughs> listen to him, you know. So, yeah, Hodge was always, he was there, man. He was really, he was for the moment. Uh, when I think back on it, um, he was extreme. The he was intense. Yeah. But Buddy Rogers, Buddy how Rogers, old was Buddy Rogers when smooth, you wrestled Smooth, smooth, Mr. Smooth. He was just so sm sure of himself, as he, and he had a right to be. Is so talented. He knew what to do, when to do it. He knew how to give his message to the crowd, uh, bring the crowd up, bring the crowd down, sit the crowd in the middle. He knew exactly. He was a master, and he was so smooth. I remember that wrestling him. You never. He didn't really. He didn't hurt you. He would let you know he was there, but um, he would just float. Around he would he was just that smooth. He had to be closing in on a sixty at that mm -hmm. time. Yeah, yeah, he was. He's, and it, he would, his psychology was um, incredible because you could feel him thinking. You could feel you didn't know exactly what, but you could feel him thinking. And every move that he made was in a deliberate type way was done for a reason. It was wasn't wasted. There was no wasted moves. If that makes any sense, yeah, I mean, sure he was that. really smooth. So after so the AWA, <coughs> the one with Martell finishes, and you and Stephen Regal, whose idea was it to put you and Stephen Regal over the Road Warriors? The I don't AWA know. <laughs> I don't know who thought of that. How, how did that conversation <laughs> go with Hawk, Animal, and Paul? We weren't even in the room. Um, we didn't even know. Uh, Steve and I, they put Mr. Electricity and I together. Uh, they even made dolls of Mr. Electricity and I and Precious. Never could figure out the connection except that we'd have great tag matches with like Kurt Henning and Scott Hall and stuff like that. Or, you know, he, he was a great talent too. Steve Regal was a, another diamond in the rough type guy that just never got a chance uh, to show his stuff too much. But the thing with the Warriors, um, you know, I always say, thank God they like Steve and I, you know, because uh, Hawk and Animal were good friends with uh, Steve and I and they liked us. And I, I'm glad because I wasn't in the room when they told him that they were going to drop the straps to uh, Regal and myself. But you know what? I'm sure they just said, "Okay, if we was going to drop them to anybody, we'd like we we it we'd like it to be them." So, did the, now a lot of people think that it was a phantom title change? Did the match in Albuquerque actually happen? Yes. It was, yeah. The, yeah. The, the the title the title change happened. Yeah. In fact, didn't it change back? Didn't we drop it to Hall and Henning in Albuquerque too? I don't remember. I don't remember either. 
so long ago. Whose finish was it? Uh, the, the drop or the win? No, the, the win. Oh, we didn't have nothing to do with that. <laughs> we stayed out of it. If you want us to win, you say you want us to do what? We're going to beat the Warriors uh, for the t title? Well, this is how we'd like to beat them. No, we didn't say that. We, we just sit there and went, okay. <laughs> who, who, who gave you the finish? Do you <clears throat> remember? I, I think um, Wally Carbo was maybe there, and, and Greg was there, Greg Gagne. And they gave us the finish, and we were just like, okay. Okay. Oh, so you didn't know until that night? No, we had no idea. We had no idea till it came time to... It was our time to figure out what are we going to do? What are we going to do? How badly are we going to get killed here, you know? You know, Jimmy, I misspoke a moment ago, and I want to correct myself. The match that people think was the uh, Phantom title switch wasn't the win over the Road Wars. That was on ESPN, of course. It was when you dropped the belt to Kurt Hennig and Scott Hall, and that was the one that was in Albuquerque. I, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, it gets a little fuzzy back then, but I think you're right. And that was an interesting uh, a match that, that took place there in Albuquerque because uh, the office thought that we weren't going to drop the titles. I don't know what gave them that idea. I have no idea. <laughs> what, why they would Is that going to be the first, it's not my fault of the tape? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not my fault they thought that, you know. Uh, but somewhere along the line in the match as we were working. Oh, now, how would they get the impression? That we weren't going to drop them? Yeah, how would you know, maybe in the maybe I was sitting in the dressing room and said, ah, well, I'm not dropping it, you know, joking around or something. Because uh, I would just joke with them. I just jerked their change, you know, just to see them react. Uh, so we went in the ring, and working with Kurt was wonderful, and God bless him, and we'll all miss him too. A wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, nothing but good things to say about him. And his dad uh, was a great guy. Uh, there, he, was, he could be scary too, but... Uh, we, we decided not to go home. They wanted us to go home in like 20 or 25 minutes. So we sa I said, let's just keep going. So we keep going. And then I talked to them in the ring, and I says, they're starting to come out and look out of the dressing room now. They think we're not going to drop the straps. Let's just take this right to the very end. So we're working. We work another 30 minutes or whatever, and now there's more office looking. Now they're thinking, oh, my God, they're not going to drop the straps. So we actually took it right down to the guy who was counting. Uh, I believe he was counting down. Timekeeper, yeah. Timekeeper was counting 10, 9, 8, you know. And then I called like a small package or something off of a slam. And, uh, that, and it just one, two, three, and that was it. And then, of course, they all were relieved <laughs> uh, that they had the title switch and all that stuff. But we were just messing with them. Cause and, Scott, we, and, and Scott and Kurt trusted you. Absolutely. And we trusted them. And... And they knew we were going to do, do them right. I mean, we never did do that. If the office wanted us to do something, we did it. Uh, we might not have did it exactly where they wanted it, but it got done. Uh, you might have stylized it. Yeah. <laughs> a little creativity there, you know? So you finish up in Minnesota, then you spend some time in Hawaii. And this had to be a culture shock in Japan when you and Patty go to Japan. Yeah, actually, too, just to back up a little bit, we went, I don't think I'm mistaken, but I think we went... Texas, uh, Hawaii, Japan, yes. Hawaii, then AWA. We took that break. And Japan was great uh, for Patty and I. Uh, we had a wonderful time. Uh, we spent a couple weeks in Hawaii on the way over and a couple weeks on the way back. Uh, Japan was nice. I mean, we, you know, we didn't take advantage of everything that we could have took advantage over there as far as pushing the gimmick. I think we were so tired from Texas. I think... Part of it might be because we were so tired from doing the Texas thing. The break in Hawaii was good. Japan was just like a vacation. How did the Japanese react to Precious? And the reason I'm asking is because the Japanese culture looks at women differently than the Western culture. Yeah. And, and so here you've got this strong woman on television backing her man. I don't, she may have been the first valet in the history of Japan. Probably was. What was the reaction? It was uh, phenomenal. I mean, they just everywhere we went over there, there was always a crowd uh, on the streets and in the arenas, and they just were kind of like, you know, the just jaw dropping type. Yeah, women. Were they didn't vulnerable. understand yeah. what she was doing up there, why she was up there, you know. And and again, I I'm, I look back on it as we were talking earlier that, you know, I didn't uh, really get creative over there. 
and I probably should have, but I didn't, uh, because we could have really, we could have really, you know, got creative with her character and the Japanese culture, because it was so different and so opposite that we could have probably made a, a bigger impact than we did. But I think we were just using it as a vacation uh, uh, more than anything. Okay. Which, are, you know, Japan, that's it. I've got an interesting story in, uh, for Japan. And when I, I'm going to see Harley Race in a little while later on, and I'm going to have to apologize to him. Uh, but uh, I don't know if I told you this story before. We had been in Japan for like three weeks or four weeks or something. We had been traveling like crazy. And we're, it's the night before we're leaving the next morning. So I'm laying in bed, Patty and I, and the phone rings. And it's like 2 in the morning. And it's Harley Race. And he's on the phone. And I go, hello? And he goes, Jimmy, this is Harley Race. And I just hung up the phone. <laughs> I thought I was having a nightmare. And Harley Race just called me in the middle of the night in, in Tokyo, you know. Ring, 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 rings again. I pick up the phone. Hello, Jimmy, don't hang up the phone. This is Harley Race. Look, I just want to make sure you know that you, that you, you know that you're in St. Louis tomorrow night against Chris Adams. And I said, no, I'm not. He says, yes, you are. And, and you're in Kansas City the night after that. So it's really important. It was sold out. You're really important. You know, tomorrow night you're in St. Louis. And I said, Harley, no, you got to be kidding me. You know, I, 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 you got to be kidding me. I just can't believe that. He says, I talked to you when you were in Hawaii, and we made the deal. And I'm just calling to remind you that you're in St. Louis tomorrow night. Well, I hung up the phone. And my wife said, who is that? And I said, Harley Race. She said, what do you want? I said, well, we're in St. Louis tomorrow night. <laughs> was, the tour, was the Japanese tour over? Yeah, it was the last night. We were catching our plane at like 6 in the morning. I can never remember which way the international dateline thing goes. Yeah, the wrong way. <laughs> 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 yeah, the wrong way. So you miss St. Louis? Uh-uh, man. Uh oh, no. So this was unbelievable. We're in Tokyo, and we're going to be in St. Louis tomorrow night. Okay. How's that going to happen? Well, the tickets, the way the tickets were made, they had me going to St. Louis. I didn't even look at them. Right. But that's where I was going. Harley, I guess, had talked to him, whatever. Well, yeah, because Harley had a great relationship yeah. with Bob and the Japan, all Japan office. Yeah, I, I was going to St. Louis and didn't even know it. So, but then I knew it. So I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to St. Louis. Okay, let's see how that's going to work. So anyway, we get up the next morning. We got on the airplane in Tokyo. Now, in the meantime, I had planned to fly my uh, oldest daughter, Brianne, and my mom from Dallas to Honolulu to spend a couple weeks on the way back from Japan. So that keep that in mind. But this is happening on that same day. So now we leave Tokyo. We fly to uh, Honolulu, jump in a taxi, run down to the Sheridan Waikiki. Our friend Dick Wood was there. Uh, we had the whole top floor suite, uh, no enormous, beautiful place. He always made sure we were taken care of there. Uh, that's where we stayed when we for two weeks before that. And um, so now we check in, get everything set with him, go back to the airport, and we go from uh, Honolulu to uh, Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles to Denver, Denver to St. Louis, land, get to the building just in time for me to put my boots on. So if the car started at 8.30, you got there at 9.30? 9.30, quarter to 10. And I had been flying, you know you know the time, I yeah, mean, from hours, Tokyo right? and all that. I mean, I've just been on the airplane. So now, and... Um, Getting back, let's back up a little bit, and I don't want to make this confusing, but it's important to realize that Carly Ra Harley Race and I did have the conversation. Uh, and it did happen at the Sheridan Waikiki on the top floor. Uh, at the time it happened, I had been over in Hawaii for about a week, and uh, uh, King Curtis was over there as well. So I ran into him, and he gave me a little of Hawaii's best 
you know, so I could indulge. <laughs> and so I had like several Mai Tais. Um, I had two safes in the room. One of them was, one of them was filled with uh, Hawaii's best, and the other one was filled with uh, fresh $100 bills from Japan. I didn't have a problem in the world. I mean, I, I was, uh, life, I was good. life was good, man. <laughs> I didn't, you know. Uh, so I ended up booking myself in one of the, I was in a state. If Harley had said, I need you on the Mars, you would have said, okay. Yeah, Harley, I have a, the utmost respect for him. And I'd really, my, and, and if you're around, you'll hear me talk to him uh, while I'm here with him uh, later on and apologize for my uh, lackadaisical behavior. Uh, but I did make that deal with him. I just didn't remember right away. And he refreshed my memory in Tokyo. So needless to say, we go and we wrestle, Chris and I and Patty uh, in uh, St. Louis. And I was about dead. And uh, I, can't, I remember I come back up to the dressing room up to upstairs, upstairs there. And Bob Geigel was there and Harley Race. And I said, Harley, I says, I'm not going to do Kansas City. I said, I'm not going to Kansas City. He says, you've got to go to Kansas City. I mean, the house is there. I mean, again, probably sold out. He says, you've got to go to Kansas City. And I says, I'm not going to Kansas City. I'm going tomorrow morning. I'm getting on a plane, and I'm going to Hawaii, and that's where I'm going. <clears throat> I guess I'm not sure why Harley didn't kill me at the time. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Harley had a piece of the Kansas City office. Oh, yeah, yeah. And plus, you know, I mean, Harley Race could kill you if he wanted to. Yes. Um, very capable, but he didn't. And I don't know why. Well, I'm not going to ask him either. Yeah, but, you're not going to read. <laughs> you know, I don't want to get that deep in. I don't want to get him that stirred up when I talk to him later. But, I, you know, he, I, we didn't go to Kansas City. Uh, we went back to the room. Of course, now what happened, you know, most of the time my timing is... Is, is Patty ever the voice of reason in all this? No, Patty, Patty's just like so over everything that she doesn't even, she just does, she just, she's just in another room pa packing and doing, getting ready to do whatever we're going to end up doing next. But uh, <clears throat> where I messed up was they always used to, my timing was always great uh, through the grace of God or whatever. I just always seemed to have pretty good timing. The timing this night was not good because I had this conversation with Bob Geigel and Harley Race prior to receiving the payoff. <laughs> you know better than that. I know. It was the it was jet lag. It was uh, Hawaii's best. I don't know what was messing with my mind, but I have really messed up because I should have waited until after they paid me. When then, they, then say, oh, by the way, you know, I'm not going to Kansas City. Instead, I, and they paid in cash, too. Right. So I took a little hit on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I took a little hit on that payoff. But, I mean, I mean, it was still more than, you know, people making a month. You know, I mean, it was uh, several, several thousands of dollars. But it could have been several more thousands of dollars for the 15 minutes or 20 minutes I was in the ring. Plus, well, probably didn't get invited back <clears throat> to Kansas City or something. No, <laughs> no, I, didn't, I don't think I did uh, for a while. But uh, then we went back, uh, slept for about four hours, caught another flight out of there, went through Dallas and Dallas, Honolulu, and that seemed like forever. But uh, that was the that was a that was just amazing. And uh, God bless Harley Race. You know, I've, I, re I really should have. You know, I, I, that was the only time I never did a show. I mean, I went to every show I was supposed to be on. I never missed a shot. Now, but I missed that one. You end up in the Carolinas, finally. Yes. Were you, oh, punished is probably way too strong of a term. I don't know. Maybe not. But there was a little bit of friction. Part, there was some friction because you turned Jim Crockett down the first time. Right, yeah. Um, and the reason I knew that is because in Fayetteville, in the building, at one time I was coming upstairs and Tully Blanchard and Flair were at the top of the stairs, <clears throat> and I'm coming up the stairs, and they're talking. I'm not sure if, yeah, I think Tully had just pulled his head out of Flair's ass uh, long enough to see me, but uh, <laughs> he, they see me, and they go, oh, here's the guy that wouldn't come when we wanted him to come the first time. Oh, now it's we. Yeah, 
and they like look at me. So I knew then, I said, well, that was just like a secret message, you know, like now they're pissed, you know, because, you know, I didn't, I turned them down. And I guess people didn't turn them down, you know. Well, I did, you know, for whatever reason. I just, I, I just wanted to go see Vern. You know, I'd never seen Vern. Yeah, I heard stories the about him. Was thriving. Yeah, and I heard stories about him, and that was my choice. Well, but ESPN, I mean, it's there was always something there anyway. There was something, <clears throat> something there. There was, there was a lot of stuff in the Carolinas when I was here with Patty that was going on. Now, you know, politics and crap. Now, when you, when you <coughs> first came to the Carolinas, was Dusty booking? I think so. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was, you went from pretty much doing your own finishes and on your own angles mm -hmm. to all of a sudden you're part of this machine. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the machine didn't run that smoothly. That's right. That was a lot of politics. There was more politics in the Carolina Territory than in Washington, D.C., there was more guys getting pushed for whatever reason that I don't know what the deal was. The prima donnas were everywhere. Right. Um, unless you had a Mercedes or a Porsche or something like that, you just weren't in there. And I don't know. I, there was a certain, there was definitely a click. click. There was a click. And click it was or clicks? Clicks. Yeah, there was, they were all one big click right. with a bunch of little clicks attached. Subclicks. Yeah, subclicks. It was it was bull crap is what it was. Um, it was hard to do business here, and that shouldn't that's that shouldn't be. You know that shouldn't be. But but you were still over. Yeah, I was over. I was going. I was over whether they liked it or not. Um, I was over. You know because the, the gimmick. The, it was it was. Well, what happened? I got was it Wahoo McDaniel's was my first guy. Right. <clears throat> so no matter who you are, if you're getting an angle with Wahoo McDaniels, God bless him, another man, a great legend that ha has a piece of my heart. You get involved with a guy like that, you don't have to do, you don't have to know very much or do very much. You're gonna something is gonna happen out of it because you're in the ring with Wahoo McDaniels. Now it just so has it that I was in the ring with Wahoo and Patty and I doing the angle, and of course by now, I mean I. They, there, I didn't have any questions about what I was doing. I knew where I, what I wanted to do, how to get it done, when to do it, how to do it, and the whole thing, and getting with the chief and doing the interviews and doing the angles and having the matches and the strap matches and all that stuff. That was just like, that was just like eating breakfast. That was a piece of cake. That wasn't even hard to figure out, this, that this was going to be good stuff. Um, so that's what kicked me off in the Carolinas. So, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like I just came in and I was over immediately. I was over because of Wahoo helped get me over and, and the fact that I, I was just over, you know. So things are going well for you as a heel. And then all of a sudden, uh, Jim Cornette throws a fireball in Ronnie Garvin's face, and now you're a baby face. Yeah, was that before the Kevin Sullivan angle? Before or? the Kevin Sullivan angle. Okay. That, that oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's what started all that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so now I'm a baby face. Well, that, you know, with a valet. With a valet. Now let me see if I can figure this out. The reason you have the valet is for the heat, more or less. At least yes. that's why I created right. it. The character Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin was basically devised to create heat. Right. Um, where's baby face come from? If baby face happens, it has to happen. I don't even know. Baby face isn't even a thing you talk about when you talk about. Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin and Precious. The hair, the music. We weren't baby yeah, faces. You know, it's, it's like having a baby face manager. It just doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah. It never did work. And now all of a sudden, I'm a baby face. Well, that was just a stupid thing to do. Well, it was stupid. But wait, it gets stupid. It gets stupid. I'm sure it does. <laughs> It'll all come back to me. But help me out here. I mean, what happened? Now, you did get, run, you get, you did get the run with Flair. Yeah, you know, basic and, and which you know, I mean, the most bizarre finish of a pay per view ever in the cage with Flair, right? Is that when the yeah, yeah, what about that? Did, they, did we ever have a finish in that match? Well, that was where the guy climbed the yeah, cage, the guy climbs the cage. What and then so what happened there? That's a big mystery there, you well, know. Flair, Flair's got you, Flair. Now my memory's fine. Well, I, he had me in the figure four. He, he got you in the figure four. The fan climbs the cage. He panics. Let's go with the figure four. I'm, a, I got, I'm in the ropes. Right. Right. Tommy Young rings the bell and gives him the match. Right. Because everybody panics when the guy starts climbing the side of the cage. Yeah. 
But that wasn't the finish. No. It wasn't even close to the finish. Nope. But that was the finish. <laughs> I don't know, you know. And I, you know, at the time, but, I, but was that what happened? Did everybody just yeah, panic when they just, stand and they stopped the match? I've had people email me on the on my website, and they'll and they, on the wrestling classics and the wrestling website. classics website, and they ask about this thing. They just watched it on tape. Of course, I haven't seen it for years and years, so they, they would know more than than I about exactly what happened. But I can remember that I was in the ropes and I didn't give up. Right. But Tommy Young rang the bell and and Flair won the match. There was no, to me, I would have to see, and if anybody out there has the tape and watches it, maybe they can watch it and then they can email us and let us know exactly what happened because to this day I have no idea. Well, I did know one thing. I wasn't going to win anyway. Right, yeah. You're that right. wasn't going to happen, you know. But it was, it, it was nice of them for, because uh, the stipulation was if, if, he if beat you win, me. you're the world champion. If he wins, <laughs> he gets five. No, he, he gets a he night gets a out. Night, he gets a night with, with Patty, and that's when Ronnie did the yes. went knocking yeah. the door, which that was a great. That was that was good. <laughs> yes, that was good. Too good, uncomfortably <clears throat> good, but very good. Yeah, it was good. You know, that was really funny with him. Uh, I'll never forget where he's, he's rinsing out his mouth with yes. the Listerine or whatever it is, and he spits it in the trash can or something. <laughs> then Ronnie knocks him out at the door. That was pretty funny, you know. Um, that was very creative, and I didn't have really a hand in that. That just kind of happened. At this point in time, but, I... But did it bother you that your big brother now has to get your woman out of the situation? Everything started to crumble about that time with everybody getting involved. Yeah, next thing you know, Kevin Sullivan wants your woman, and right. you've got 16 guys yeah. coming to your defense. Yeah, everybody's coming to save me now. <laughs> what the heck's with that, you know? I've been, I've, you know, that is so ludicrous. I mean, well, the fact of the matter is it's true. I mean, I remember the one time at TBS when Dusty even brought himself out and stood in between me and Kevin or something, or like he was my daddy or he was protecting me from the boogeyman or something. Uh, that was crap, you right. know? Get your own angle and do your own thing oh, I see, you can't get an angle to top this one, so you're going to come in on mine, right? <laughs> Basically, you know, I mean, I, I, and I just call a spade a spade. I mean, they, if you were any kind of a, had any sense at all, you don't, that's not your angle. It's like the Tower of Doom thing. We talked about that earlier. Yeah, how does that turn into a 10-man tag team match? Yeah, and Hawk saves the girl. Right. Well, the, I need to save the girl, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I'm not being, I'm not being a glory or, or anything no, about it. It's just it's that that's the way... If you're going to do this, let's do it right. And like I was t Roy Rogers always saved day 11. <clears throat> That's right. Tom Mix never came into the movie. No. John no. Wayne never saved day 11. Even though he could have. Could have. But the, the, the writers knew that he doesn't belong in this part of the movie, you know? So I was getting an influx of people, and the tower was one where every, we had the whole territory was climbing the cage. Uh, oh, yeah, because not only do you have 10 men in the cage, but the entire territory climbs. Climbs after to do the save. Snake Brown is climbing the cage. To save Precious, yeah. I mean, I'm surprised Gary Jester wasn't up there climbing the cage. <laughs> With his fist tape. Or Jackie Crockett, <laughs> maybe, or something. There were so many people there. And I think I was laying down in the corner, like, didn't know what nothing to do. You would think that someone was trying to water down my thing or discredit me or something. You would think that someone was trying to, like, cash in or, or ride my wagon. Hmm. I don't understand it, but one thing was clear is I was never in the clique. Right. I wasn't in it in 77, well, and I wasn't in it in 86. Well, Jim Barnett lets you know on no uncertain terms how much you weren't in the clique at, mm -hmm. at one point, didn't he? That's right. Um, <clears throat> um, the sale had happened. When the sale happened, when Turner, when Turner bought Crockett, and then they had the meeting down in Atlanta... So the territory goes down to Atlanta, and well, we never, Patty and I didn't get invited down there, and I thought, well, maybe they just, maybe it, it got lost, it got in, lost the mail. in the mail. Yes. You know, I mean, surely, you know, the, the gimmick is worthy, you know. So I said, well, we'll go down there anyway. So we drove down to Atlanta, and we go in this room, and the whole territory is in the room. Hell, every, everybody. Job guys, top guys, middle, middle of the road guys. So we walk in. Well, Jim Barnett looks at me and looks at Patty. 
and a couple other stooges over in the corner, and then they start doing like the stooge whispering. So Barnett comes, well, he doesn't run. He kind of flutters over. <laughs> Barnett kind of, no, he swishes over <laughs> like only Jim Barnett could do. Oh, Jim, my boy. Yeah, can I talk to you outside? I'm not even going to try to go there with that, but <laughs> can I talk to you outside? I says, yeah. So he says, look, he says, uh, must be some kind of mistake. Uh, we don't have you, you know, you're not, you're not, on, you're not on the list. You're not, you're not part of the team. Here's uh, some money for your trans or whatever. Uh, we'll see you later. And I thought, what the hell is this? You know, I was on the team. Now this got bought and that got bought. Now I'm not on the team. Okay, well that doesn't surprise me but because. But you're keeping Snake Brown. Snake Brown was in there, brother. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and I don't know who else. You know, his whole. I don't. I. It was just like you know, I know that I didn't always play the game the way they wanted me to play it. Uh, that was probably the problem, and that's too bad. You know, I, mean, I, I don't. That's a. I just had a good time, you know. I mean, I don't. I could go on and on about what I think about what they did, and and you know, like the the baby doll and right. Dusty thing, was or baby doll and, and Tully. Tully. Yes. Well, actually, it was baby doll and whoever. Right. Right. So there wasn't a real, you know, that could be passed around a little bit. So I mean, I don't know. The gimmick, you mean? Yeah, the gimmick. Okay. Not not the girl. She's she's a good girl, but the gimmick. I mean. I mean. Just I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to remember where, where, they, where they sold out at, and I can't remember. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what records they busted. Or. Right. Now Vince wanted you and Precious to come up to New York, and when that didn't happen, Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth Elizabeth was born. Right. Um, but at least <clears throat> that was a little different, where Elizabeth just yeah. didn't talk or. Well. Yeah, she did too. <laughs> when you, I don't. I, I can't say any bad things about Miss Elizabeth, no. God bless her, uh, and Randy Savage is a talent in his own right, and I can't take nothing away from him there. They had, they, I, they were created for whatever reason. Um, Baby Doll and whoever was created for whatever reason, but really, it, it didn't matter to me, because my, I think my gimmick stood alone. Right. I mean, I think that there wasn't com it wasn't competition. It was at, you know often duplicated. What is that? Often whatever. Often imitated, never, never duplicated. Never duplicated. It was one of those things, and because um, I don't because I'm not sour about it by no means. It's just you know it's just funny how that stuff happens. The Crockett thing was a real mess though. It was like terrible. Did Ric Flair, when he was booking, try to fire you when your three, house? Three times. Yeah, when my house got destroyed by Hurricane Hugo. Yeah. Uh, tell that story. Uh, th thank goodness I was home. And um, and I was watching the Weather Channel, and I said, this is coming. You know, I mean, this is going to be bad. So I took everybody and put them downstairs. And underneath this, uh, we had a s downstairs where there was a stone uh, stairwell going down there and up. And I put underneath was a room. It was the strongest part of the house. So I put everybody in the house. <clears throat> Make a long story short, about 3 or 4 in the morning, man, all hell broke loose. I heard like this train. They say you can hear uh, it's a tornado like a train. <clears throat> I always thought, that's a bunch of bull. But no, it sounded like my insides were vibrating. It sounded like I was sitting on the bumper of a train. And all of a sudden, uh, all hell broke loose. I mean, a 90-foot oak tree went through two stories of the house. A uh, tornado dropped out of there, turned my house 20 degrees off the foundation, totally destroyed my house, caved in the top two floors, and um, it was t it was a catastrophe. And I had two little children there and my and uh, my wife. So anyway, the next day I was booked somewhere I can't remember, and I couldn't go. I mean, I just couldn't go. I had no place to live. My house was destroyed. My kids are like. You know, Daddy, what to, are we gonna do? to yeah. this day, you know, they see a dark cloud, you know, and they, or thunder, or, or tornado warning, or tornado watch, will really shake them up bad to this day. And I'm talking, this is, it was in 80, 89 or something like that, maybe somewhere in there, September of 89, September 22nd, I think it was, uh, 21st, 22nd. So Flair tells Michael that, uh, you know, okay, if I'm, if I'm, because Mike went to the shot. I didn't go to the shot and said, well, you know, that he's fired, you know, and he's trying to tell the office, you know, we'll just tell him he's fired. 
So, you know, Michael comes back and says, well, Flair's, you know, trying to you know, tell him you're fired if you don't make your shots and stuff. And I said, well, I'm not going to be there tonight either, you know. So that night rolled around and word got back to me that, you know, I was trying to, you know, Flair's trying to get me fired again. And then the third night I didn't make it because I'm trying to get a hotel now. By now I got the insurance company, got the hotel, and the kids are kind of calmed down. I mean, the guy across the street was an executive for a mayonnaise company, and I mean, he got the whole week off. Uh, and his house didn't even get damaged. <clears throat> but uh, World Championship Wrestling and uh, Flair and the uh, uh, upper echelon the office guys would never called me and said, hey, are you okay? Is your kids okay? Uh, is your family okay? I heard your house got destroyed. I mean, my house was, go they had to tear my whole house down. Uh, that's the business. I mean, that's what that's, they, you know, that's, that's just a real good example of, of how you were cared about um, as an athlete, work as a wrestler, not only for that, that organization, but any organization. Uh, it's just amazing. You had opportunities to go to the WWE, but you never thought that would be a good idea for you. No, because when I retired in uh, 92, I talked to Pat Patterson and them things, you know, I talked to Joe Scarpa. And, and so I said, you know, I mean, at the time in 92, I thought, well, maybe, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe I go see what's going on up there. You know, maybe I t t t tip my toe in the water, you know, see what, see what. I never really was, over, I never really cared much for the operation. It's kind of like the North and the South. I was always like the Southern guy and, you know, he was always like, you know, Northern guy. So uh, I didn't think he cared for me that much anyway. I mean, cause I'm trying to figure, okay, what happened to the last Southern guy that went up there? Uh, what happened to him? Let's see, Dusty Rhodes. Oh, that's right. He was putting a pink polka dot, polka dot spandex outfit with a soul sister for a valet. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Ronnie went up there, he marched around with a two by four, like a soldier, around Duggan and all that. Right. And I know Ronnie Garvin, and he's not really into marching around like he's pretending he's got a gun on his soldier, I mean a gun on his shoulder. And I'm thinking about all these other characters that went up there and got chewed completely up. Uh, Steve Kern went up there. And they made him a gator hunter. A gator hunter. Uh, Matt Bourne went up there. Made him a clown. Made him a clown. So I'm not getting real good vibes right. off this. Uh, I'm from the South, and I'm going to go up there and become the next Hulk Hogan right. type thing, or Randy Savage, or, Roddy Piper. or Roddy Piper. It doesn't look good for a Southern boy to go up there. You know, it's kind of like the wrong neighborhood. But I'll go up there anyway. So then, as it unfolded, Pat says, "Yeah, they, he sent me a ticket, and he says, yeah, we want you to come up. I forgot the city, and uh, Vince wants you to try it, do a tryout.'" And I'm thinking, a tryout? What am I going to try out? What am I trying? Try out for what? You know? Try out. I've been in the business 23 years. You know, I've been wrestling since I was nine. You know, I'm going to, I'm 40. You know, I've, my whole life has been in the entertainment business. Um, and you, and I'm going to go try out? So that had me a little boggled. You know, I thought, what the heck? You know, that's typical. You know, he wants me to try out. I got something he can try out, but I went up there anyway because I wanted to see some friends. Right. <clears throat> I said, well, hell, I'll just fly up there. I'll see Pat and some of the guys were up there. So I go up there, make a long story short, and I go, okay, what am I, what am I doing? He says, well, you're going to do an interview with uh, Gene Oakland. And um, I said, well, what am I talking about? Well, just whatever. You know, talk about the some kind of match pay-per-view they had going or something like that. I don't know what it was. It was very generic. Uh, and I said, well, okay, you know, what do you want me to wear? What's the, give me some, give me, give, you know, you, you hire an actor, you should at least tell him kind of what his role is or, or maybe is he in a cowboy movie? Is he in a, a spy, spy movie? movie? Is he in a space movie? Or what's he, you know, what's, give me some, no idea. Okay, okay. So I had this interview with Oakland and it was mediocre because I was pretty pissed off. I mean, I thought, what the hell am I doing here, you know? I mean, I, this is a bad, I'm getting real bad vibrations. And I had seen Vince in the hallway earlier, and we had eye contact. I seen him at the hotel, too, and we kind of did a cold handshake uh, the first time I met him. And then we seen each other in the hallway, 
And he's walking by me, and I'm, I remember I'm sitting in a chair, and I'm watching him as he's walking by me. We, we had eye contact, and he just walked right on by me. And I didn't say nothing to him, and he didn't say nothing to me. I didn't care if I talked to him, and I could tell he didn't care if he talked to me. So I knew we just didn't get along right, right off the bat. I wasn't going to kiss his ass, and he certainly wasn't going to kiss mine. Uh, and then they, they came up with the idea. They said, well, you, you need to change your name. I said, well, I'm not changing my name. You know, I'm not, I'm, I mean, what, what are you going to call me, Doc Hendricks or something like that, you know? Which I never really thought Michael should have did that either, but that's another story. <clears throat> so I said, I'm not changing my name. So there, so that didn't get over real good with them. So we just didn't get along. So that's why I never went up there. And it's a good thing because I would have left. The first time he had tried to make me do something really stupid, I would have just walked out the door. And I think he knew that. And, uh, and I, you know, I mean, I hate, you know, he's got a great business and he runs it the way he wants to run it, but I prefer not to be a part of it. And I wasn't. That, 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 that answers the question, but that's a good segue in the fact that you've always been your own guy. You've always had a very good mind for professional wrestling. When you Did, were, I didn't always use it, but I had it. <laughs> but you had it. Well, but in Texas, <laughs> yeah. we talked about they were all your angles, your finishes, yeah. for the most part. I mean, there was some input from Kenny, some input from Michael. Yeah. But you had a track record of success mm. at booking yourself. Mm. Did anybody ever come up to you and talk to you about, Jimmy, we think you'd make a good booker for a territory? No, not really. I think about that, and I think when I was in uh, Vern's territory, I had s had set a few, sat down with Greg Gagne and had a few beers, and because they, they never really had an official booker. I mean, Bachwinkle would do it one week, and Greg would do it the next, and somebody else would come in and do it the next. And who was the booker? Well, we don't we don't really have a booker. So I said, man, you know, and I had a few ideas going on. I talked to Greg. That's about as close as I ever come to to doing something like that. But I never was. Uh, I didn't. I, I wasn't in the right frame of mind. I mean, I wasn't in. Even though I had, probably I could have. It's like you have a guy that can do, wear a nice suit like you have on now. By the way, you look very sharp, um, and do a great job. I wasn't that type of guy. Now, I, could I put a suit on and do that? Yeah, I probably could. Would I be happy? I don't know. You know. Plus, I was always partying and raising hell. You know. I mean, that was my whole. That was probably my whole thing. You know. I mean. I had, I had such a great career with the numbers and everything. You know, that's that's good. But I had a better time, you know. And I'm not saying the whole thing was a party because it wasn't. I mean, I paid. No, you took care of business. So you, yeah. you only missed one day. I missed that one and, day. And you just did, and you just paid. I tried to have a good time. I just tried. I was uh, easy going. And you just paid public penance for the one uh, date that you missed. Yeah, I sure did. Jeez. And then you may pay a physical penance if you keep bringing it up to Harley Race. Oh, I know. Maybe I should won't talk to him about that. <laughs> okay. So let's say that for whatever reason you had been a booker, and, and somebody just made you the offer, Jimmy, you're a great mind. You've got to book the territory, and here's a basket of money to do it. How would you have handled booking somebody like you, somebody that was headstrong, wanted to do things his way? Well, you know, I, I, in, in creating that fictitious scenario, right. the, only, the only way I would be able to handle it would be to sit down and talk to the guy and say, look, this, this is kind of what I got in mind. Now, the guy might tell me to piss off or something, or he might, you know, if he's like me, you know, he might not be paying attention or something. There's always a way to work around that. I just think you just have to talk to people and, and find out, you know, you have to develop a rapport and find out which door you need to come in to get to them. And I guess that, you know, in, in doing a booking job, which I just, that was never me, man. I mean, I just could, I just, just, just didn't want that. It just, it, it, it's different. Yeah, it's, you know, I had Michael and I sat in the car for hours and hours and hours, and we'd talk about angles. Well, and, and, and you're right, because being a good booker, everybody thinks being a good booker is being creative and coming up with angles. That's just a fraction of booking. Yeah. You know, there's the dealing with the egos, there's the paperwork, there's making sure everybody's on time, there's the... Yeah. yeah, there's a lot involved, but a lot of it is with the angles. I mean, you can always get one of your stooges to do the paperwork, and you can always get one of the stooges to run down and see if everybody's, you know, showing up through the door on time. You know, I mean, there's plenty, there was plenty of those around. There was never a shortage 
of stooges that would do that kind of work. Uh, I just got to think back on it to think that um, I just wasn't in the right frame of mind to, to be no booker. I'd book with Michael. Michael and I would book Dallas, you know, I mean, wow. sitting in the car and come up with ideas for everybody. That was my type of environment. Like, if you wanted to sit down and have a beer or d drink a fifth of Jack or something and we'll talk over some angles we'll t and do a create a six-week or seven-week program, that I'll, I'll work with you there. But I'm not going to the office and sitting there all day and going out booking doing shoes. all this kind of thing and trying to deal with this and deal with that. It just was, I never took it that serious. I guess that's what I'm, where I'm going with. I never, it was never that serious to me because it, this wrestling was a, st a stage of my life. It was not my life. And that's why there's a difference. Does that make sense too? Sure, it sure does. I mean, if you're a booker, you gotta have, a, if you're a bona fide booker, not only do you have to be creative and, and uh, talented in many ways, but you have to put your heart and soul and live to live wrestling. Right. And even though I lived wrestling for 23 years by doing it, uh, Jimmy Williams was in there somewhere. Right. He just hadn't come out yet. So it was just a stage, it, it was a stage of my life. Right, exactly. Kind of. Do you have world title aspirations? Did I? And did you ever think about no. being the world heavyweight no. champion? No, uh-uh, no. Too it, much responsibility. Even, because the Martell matches were great. Yeah. It was a great program. Nobody came up and yeah. said, yeah, no, I can keep up with Rick Martell, who's a great world heavyweight champion, maybe. I was an outlaw, rebel, outlaw, redheaded stepchild, call it what you want, but I didn't, I didn't want the time. I didn't, I guess I didn't want it, you know? That's the only thing I can think about. I didn't want it because if I wanted it, I would have, I would have went after it. There's nothing in my career that I really, if I wanted it, I would, I would do it. I'd go get it. I guess I didn't want it. There was talk in wrestling for years that there was a rift between you and Ronnie. Mm -hmm. However, you and Ronnie went to Montreal for a summer and mm -hmm. had a sensational run with the Rougeos. Yeah, 1985. Talk about how that came about. The Rougeau thing? Yeah. Well, I was in uh, Vern's territory. Uh, Jacques called me and Jacques had talked to Ronnie and Ronnie was in somewhere else, Carolinas maybe, uh, or Georgia. And so they're talking to us separately and Ronnie and I never really talked about it, except maybe once. We says, hey, you know, what do you think about this thing? Oh, well, the fishing's good, you know, and we can go camping. And I said, yeah, that's good, because Patty's family's from up there, too, and the kids can go visit their grandmother. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. I think we just kind of just showed up up there. He came on his flight. I came on mine. We stood there, you know. It's fair to say that the relationship between you and Ronnie is strained. Yes. Well, it is strained, and it only because... Uh, Ronnie's headstrong, and so am I. Ronnie's like the alpha male, and so am I. Uh, and then it goes further back than that, too. I think really, you know, when I lost my dad when I was 12, uh, I never really got over that, you know? I mean, that was devastating, and anybody that loses a parent uh, can, can uh, knows what I'm talking about. And... Um, Especially at 12, you know, with, with losing your, your dad, that you don't, you know, you never had a chance to have a beer with them or talk shit or nothing like that, you know. So, and then when Ronnie came in the picture, you know, he was only Ronnie's only eight years older than than I am. And suddenly he's your stepdad. Now he's my stepdad. Now let's see. Let me do the math. I'm 14. He's 22. Well, what's a 22-year-old know about raising a 12-year-old boy? Or my sister, you know, 10, 11, you know, my two other younger brothers, two and three. N the answer is nothing, you know. And I didn't, so I, and I didn't really chum up to him anyway. Not to mention the fact that, you know, he, he wasn't my father. Right. He was my, he was my mother's husband type right. of thing. And even when we'd play around in the house, you know, when I was young, I remember wrestling with him a little bit. And he'd get a little stiff with me. And I'm only a kid, you know, but I think back on it now. And he was being a little stiff with me, you know. Yeah, he busted my nose and, you know, you know. I, uh, I didn't care for him a whole lot. And we, it, we still, we don't talk that much. And uh, I guess if we seen each other, we'd still talk. 
but we just never got close. Yeah, the relationship strength. To say the least. But like, we're not enemies or nothing. No, but I, mean, but I mean, he could care less if he sees me ever again, and I could care less if I ever see him again. <sighs> nothing personal. It's just that we didn't get along when I was 12, and, <clears throat> you know, we didn't get along even when we were, we were in the ring. I mean, we, we, we owned the airplane together and flew together, and, you know, my, I respected him because my mom was married to him and stuff for years and years. And you respect him as a talent. Yeah, I'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, you know, stiff guy and headstrong and stuff. We just didn't, I just, you know. But that didn't stop us from selling out the forum or any other place that we went. No, I mean, that, that's <laughs> the amazing thing. After everything you've just told us, when the, the, they turned the lights on and played the music. The shit was on. Right, exactly. Yeah. We got to work. We worked together. And, um, and what would happen is I would just let him go. You know, okay. Because there's two of us. One of us is going to lead. One of us is going to follow. Well, he certainly isn't going to follow. Right. I know that. So let me save myself some grief here. So you I'll gonna, follow. So it was either follow and make money or walk off. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll follow. I don't have a problem with that. You know. Okay. You're the you're the you're the big man on the street. Go ahead. You know. Whatever. You know. It's kind of like being with Michael. <laughs> you know. Michael was always like the. Michael was always the, the figure. Right. And I was like always the straight man, kind of. I don't care. You know, if you want to be the star, the superstar, go ahead. I'll just sit back here. I don't know. I just didn't have that. I didn't have that ego thing going. Chris Adams or Rick Rochelle? <clears throat> Talent? Talent. Gosh. You know... Chris Adams was so talented, and so was Rick. That's I'm I'm t I really well, of course it's a tough show. That's you know, that's why it's fun. Yeah, um, I'd have to say Rick Martel. I just would because he was just he was, but Chris was so there too. But right. Chris uh, Martel, let me let me tell you how I made that decision. Martel could lead a match, and it would be great. Chris could be led, and it would be great. You know what I'm saying? Usually a heel called the match. Right. Usually it was the heel that called the spots and did all the stuff. Uh, and I could call a great match just to Chris, and Chris would be right there, right there. But now, let's switch it around. Let me be the baby face. Let Chris be the heel, and all I'll do is listen. Chris, you call the match. It, be, it would be different. Martel, I could call the match. He could listen. It'd be a great match. We could switch it. I could listen. He could call the match, and it would be a great match. That's how I made that decision. Martel could not only follow, and, but he could also orchestrate a great match. Martel or Ric Flair? <clears throat> Martel. Because, I mean, Martel is more versatile. You could go in the ring with Martel seven nights in a row, and never do the same thing. Was, Mar was Martel your favorite opponent? He would, he would probably be right up there. The Chief has a place in my heart, because that was always like Battle City. <clears throat> but for, for technical type, for beautiful wrestling, right. it's kind of a weird word to use, but just the way the psychology and the I can just think about working with Martel, you know, and I'd grab a headlock, you know, and I'd twist a headlock. And not only would I be s selling the headlock, but he would be selling the way I was doing it, too. So between the two of us, it was like music. And we'd go into a spot, you know, where if I'd throw him off, I'd take a tackle, boom. My, me going down was good. The way he would give it was good, and, and the way he would take off and hit the ropes again. Everything was just so fluid and smooth and go behind, take down, sit out, escape, <coughs> wrist locks, whatever it was, it didn't matter. It was like a dance with Martel. Who's the most underrated, or is there an underrated guy? Oh yeah, there's several. Who, who's I, your favorite opponent that the fans <coughs> probably underrated? That never, never got a break or something, or yeah. just never got a chance to see how talented he was? Yeah. Well, I mentioned Mr. Electricity before, but he was talented. Um, he would be just one of many. Um, 
And there's so many. You know, I, I think back, the name Charlie Fulton comes to my mind. And I remember Charlie Fulton, he was basically a job guy. Right. <coughs> but he had great talent. He just never got a chance to, to, to grow it, you know, or to experiment. There was diamond in the rough type stuff. There was a lot of guys that way. I, I, right now, I'm really just, the, the names escape me because I, there's <coughs> so many good, g great talent that never got discovered or never got a chance. How much fun did you have doing the behind the scenes, the Great American Bash DVD? That was just, you know, had the camera there. It just so happened, I took it mostly for taking it in the airplane to film when we were flying across the country. And I thought, well, I'll take it in the dressing room. It just kind of happened. It wasn't a planned thing. But I have, I have had more fun watching it than actually doing it. Because at the time, I was never thinking about what I was doing. I was just kind of filming our lives. But I've had a lot of fun watching what actually, because you can sit back and go, man, that, <clears throat> I remember that night in Kansas City, or I remember that night in Oakland. At the time, it wasn't thought of as uh, ever going to be shown to anybody. It was just for my personal, you know, little records and stuff. Well, it's a great, intimate, behind-the-scenes look at professional wrestling. Jimmy Garvin, con gorgeous Jimmy Garvin, congratulations on not only the Great American Bash the DVD, but just a spectacular career. Thank you very much, Mark, and just to take a few seconds to thank the fans uh, for all the years of their support, and without them, I never could have expressed myself. Uh, I, I liken it to something to the tune of an artist, that I was an artist that had a blank sheet of paper to work with, and the fans provided me with that paper and with the paints and, and allowed me to be creative and allowed me to enjoy myself. And um, I thank my family for sticking with me. Patty, 35 years we've been together, been together since we were kids, uh, two wonderful children, and through the grace of God uh, that I'm even sitting here today because I should have probably died uh, several times uh, in my 23 years, four times around the world and all the crap that I got into. And I'm very thankful to God that um, he's watched over me. And that's the most important thing in my life right now. Well, thank you for your time. For gorgeous Jimmy Garvin, I'm Mark Nolte. Thank you.